when we started out on this series on uh, antenna comparisons, we weren't really sure quite where it would go. Here is the uh, second comparison video which our friend Mike Harwood has put together comparing uh, four different magnetic loops. This is a very detailed video so you may want to skip forward to the section of interest but really it shows four of our favourite uh, magnetic loop antennas. All the antennas that you see in this comparison video are highly recommended by SDR Play for use with the RSP family of SDR receivers. Hello and welcome to part two of the SDR Play magnetic loop antenna comparison. Wideband or aperiodic or non-resonant antennas have a number of advantages. They can cover a number of bands from VLF to HF, they're reasonably sized, they do not need mounting particularly high, and they do not need an explicit ground connection. They have the ability to be rotated to null out interference, and because they respond primarily to the magnetic H field, they provide high rejection of near field electric interference that is too close to the radiating source to have created a transverse EM wave. This video is aimed at testing four such wideband magnetic loop antennas receiving the same broadcast signals simultaneously. This is achieved with two RSP duo receivers and many thanks to SDR Play for making them available. By comparing all antennas simultaneously, we can ensure that we're being fair to all antennas by making sure they receive the same signals at the same time under the same conditions. In addition, by testing all antennas together, we can better determine or identify or understand anomalies with a given antenna. A good example of this is if we looked at two antennas rather than four, and we looked at the water fill plots, and one of them showed some extra traces. Now, there could be some two different reasons for this, at least. I mean, one of them could be that one of the loops has a sensitivity problem and can't uh, resolve the other traces. The other could be that the different antenna has an intermodulation distortion problem or mixing problem where it creates extra uh, traces by uh, summing uh, two or multiplying two different uh, signals together. By having four loops, we're in a better position to narrow down on what the, uh, the underlying reason is behind differences with antennas and therefore make a fair and more exhaustive comparison. Two of the loops that we will be comparing today are the Benito Mega Loop FX and the Wellbrook ALA 1530N. These are both uh, professionally constructed loops, uh, fully assembled uh, and split between two sections. There is the loop and the masthead amplifier, which you can see on the picture here for those two loops. And also there is a bias T and power supply unit, which is remote at the other end of the coax cable and close to the receiver. The other two loops are the LZ1AQ and the Cross Country Wireless LAA++ loops. These are slightly less assembled than the Benito and the Wellbrook loops. These loops come with a assembled masthead amplifier, but they come available more with a wire freeform loop that you can form the antenna yourself in the shape that is convenient for your application. In this case, I have constructed a one meter diameter rigid uh, loop with a copper microbore tubing. Uh, again, with the LZ1AQ, some assembly is needed in, because the uh, antenna system is quite uh, diverse, having uh, loop modes, uh, conventional electric field modes, and you have to uh, solder some box with switches together to uh, get the full product. In addition, there is a, a separate uh, bias T arrangement and this is not uh, enclosed in the case, so something needs to be arranged for that. Similarly with the cross-country wireless loop, again there is a, a freeform wire aerial, uh, there is the fully assembled uh, masthead amplifier, but the bias T and power supply are separate. In fact, the power supply for either of these is, is not supplied and you have to uh, arrange your own. So th these are less expensive, considerably less expensive than the Benito and the Wellbrook, but they're not immediate plug and play solutions. 
Okay, for the four-way magnetic loop comparison, the first thing I thought I'd go through would be the rules of the game, how we were going to compare them and what we were going to look at and what we were not going to do. Uh, I know that uh, the, these seven points I bring up will be controversial and other people would do it a different way. However, what I thought I'd do is explain what I'm doing and why and uh, if people would prefer to do some uh, uh, further measurements themselves or make any suggestions, then that would be great. Uh, first point is four loop antennas and we're going to have these at least five metres apart, that's five metres on the ground apart, uh, so that the magnetic loops uh, do not interfere or if they do interfere it will be uh, interference that is similar to the separation to ground or small pieces of metal that you would find in real applications. All four loops were mounted with the centres about 2.2 metres above the ground. This, by my own experimentation and by things I've read, seems to be about an ideal height for this type of loop. Other people may have different experiences, but I've gone with what seems to be at least a majority opinion. All loops in this setup were arranged with their planes facing north-south, so that's the received loop plane facing north-south, so the received radiation pattern is orientated perpendicular to that, so it will be picking up transmitters mainly on the east-west uh, locations. All loops were powered with their stop power supply, so in the case of the Wellbrook and the Bonito, that was what was uh, provided with it. However, for the uh, cross-country wireless and the LZ1AQ, a regulated stabilised power supply was used no switched mode power supplies were used uh, anywhere in the system. We decided against using batteries to power the LNAs in order to provide some indication of normality to the comparison in that uh, the manufacturers provide a bias T and so it made sense really to use that and include that in the performance ratings that were given for each of the loops. So if the bias T had a problem when connected to a particular antenna, that would at least be brought out. In addition, if for instance the, there is a limitation with a bias T arrangement or a power supply, or indeed with a power supply rejection of the low noise amplifier, this will be seen in the performance metrics for that particular antenna. Measurements for all four loops were, taking, were taken simultaneously, in this case during the daytime, that was just a matter of uh, organisation or convenience. All SDR UNO display settings, I say display as opposed to any of the electrical ones, these were made identical for the four loops. And this was to allow, when looking at the waterfall curves and any of the uh, other visual in information in SDR UNO, it allowed the comparison to be made directly visually between the different plots. So that would be essentially the settings for the gain, the contrast, the spectral base and the spectral range. One thing that was done, and other people may have different opinions on this, the RF gain was optimised on the RSP duo for each individual loop to allow each antenna to perform at its best. Some people would say, well, why not have a fixed setting for everything and we'll measure everything under the same conditions. However, that seemed a little bit unfair because there is no absolute correct setting. And so by having one setting chosen and sticking with that between all the four antennas, I risked biasing the test against one of the one or more of the individual loops. So what I thought I'd do was give every loop the best chance to give the best performance on the day. Here we have just a couple of pictures showing the setup that was used to make the measurements. On the left we have the two SGR, two RSP duo devices, maybe this should be called an RSP quattro device, and this was used to receive the signals from the four antennas. Uh, they were connected together using uh, similar cables, and uh, or at least similar cables between the bias T and the antenna, which was RG58 and 20 metres of that. Uh, the cables between the bias T and the radio, these are much smaller cables, and these were identical cables for three cases, except for the Wellbrook, where there is a, a hardwired connection between uh, the RJ, sorry, between the BNC uh, socket plug and the bias T arrangement itself. 
the uh, RSP duos were identical and also the USB cables were identical. On this side here, all I'm really showing here is um, a partial setup with the two monitors and a photograph of the two monitors was taken to allow a comparison between the four waterfall curves for a given configuration for the four different antennas. For the four-way magnetic loop comparison, we looked at a number of different uh, broadcast bands and amateur bands. And the first broadcast band we looked at was the long wave band. The format of the results that will be presented will be very similar for, the, for a number of different uh, uh, frequencies. And they show this uh, window format with the four different STR UNO settings. At the top left, we have the Bonito Mega Loop FX. The top right, we have the Cross Country Wireless LAA++. At the bottom left, we have the LZ1AQ. And at the bottom right, we have the Wellbrook ALA 1530N. The two signals grouped together on the left actually relate to one of the RSP Duo devices. And on the right, it relates to the second RSP Duo device. The cursor in this case is placed at 198 kilohertz, which is the Droitwich transmitter in the UK, which for those from the UK will know that is a, a powerful long wave transmitter that is good for setting things up and checking everything's working OK. And in this case, for all four loops, the signal to noise ratio was varied between about 47 and 51 dBs. There was no obvious benefit from any loop as opposed to another one in regard to signal to noise ratio on that strong transmission. One thing that was noticed was on the LZ1AQ transmitter, there were some extra spikes that appeared on the on the uh, spectral plot. These didn't appear to be genuine signals at the time, and the next day they were not present. So they could that could well be a setup related artifact. So what I'd say is they were discovered. So if anyone else saw something similar, then they're not alone. But I think it's also fair to say that uh, I wouldn't judge the LZ1AQ based on that because they certainly weren't repeatable. It's probably fair to say as well that in terms of the overall uh, signal strength, probably the Wellbrook and the LZ1AQ loops had the best signal to noise ratio for weak signals. This is a marginal aspect, but I think that that's a fair, a fair conclusion. But that isn't really to say that the other two were bad. And here we have a repeat measurement on the long wave band showing the LZ1AQ uh, antenna did not show those spikes when the measurement was taken at a different time. So it's not thought to be a genuine artifact of the antenna. The medium wave results for the four loops reminded me a bit of one of those competitions given as a child where there are two pictures and you have to spot the difference in any of them. And it was much the same here really. The performance on the medium wave band and the, these are all a mixture of strong national signals and weaker international signals they're all very similar for the uh, for the four loops the signal to noise ratio for the 693 kilohertz signal which those in the uk will know is radio 5 live that was around 40 dbs for all four loops and i think it's fair to say that there were no winners and no losers with these strong signals all of the loops performed comparably, and even with the small signals, there was no massive difference in performance between the, the, four, the four cases. The same trend with very similar levels of performance extended to the 75 meter band, where we saw near identical performance between all four loops. Possibly the Benito and the cross country wireless loops had a slightly worse SNR. Uh, again, this is this is marginal, but that, that, that would appear to be the case here. It's also fair to say that the LZ1AQ perhaps had slightly better noise performance, but was maybe a little bit more prone to interference. And by that, I mean that on the signals that were received, the signal to noise ratio looked a bit better for them. But to other parts in the band, there did seem to be more noise from the uh, LZ1AQ. Measurements on the 60 meter band were complicated by the fact that there were no audio or CW signals present during the test. In terms of the, uh, the signals and data that was received, the LZ1AQ seemed a little more sensitive and 
I think it's fair to say that the LZ1AQ and cross-country wireless loops were on the verge of resolving one signal. This is the signal shown in, which circled in red with a small spike on the uh, plot, which the other loops did not resolve. However, there really wasn't much to choose between all four loops. But having said that, with no audio or CW signals, it's very difficult to form a comparison and say, well, which is the best? Because obviously there's nothing received to make that conclusion from. Again, on the 49 metre and also on the 41 metre bands that I'll show the results for in a moment, there was nothing really again to choose between the different loops. No obvious winners or losers. With the identical configuration that we had, the spectral plot and the waterfall curves all looked very similar between all four cases for 49 metres. And also for 41 metres, there was no discernible difference. Again, for the 31 metre band, there wasn't much to choose between the, the four different loops in this uh, test either. One aspect that has been shown is uh, ellipsed in red, and that is the, this particular band of signals on the LZ1AQ and the cross-country wireless loop, uh, where there seems to be some uh, spreading of the signals, interference uh, between them, that isn't present on the Benito and the Wellbrook. Now, this could be an aspect of the antennas concerned. However, it probably should also be noticed is that the LZ1AQ and the cross country wireless loops were slightly closer to the house than the, the other two. So although they were separated from the house probably by close on 10 meters, they were still closer by about five meters to the house than the other two loops. So that could well be an explanation for this, but this shows the level of difference between the two antennas, between the four antennas that we're seeing based on these two groups of two, if we can resolve differences due to, you know, the proximity to the house. Again, on the 25 uh, meter band, there wasn't much again to choose between the loops, maybe a slightly better signal to noise ratio on the Wellbrook, but if there was, it's certainly not a big effect. On the 22 metre band, again, everything very similar, maybe a slightly better signal to noise ratio for the LZ1AQ and the Wellbrook for small signals, but again, a very minimal effect. And on the 19 metre band, all signals again, very small, maybe a slightly degraded signal to noise ratio for the cross country wireless loop, just looking by the the size of the uh, spikes on the spectral trace and the thickness of the lines on the, or the, the color contrast of the lines on the waterfall curve, but a very, very marginal effect if, if there is one. We now move our focus from the broadcast bands to the amateur bands, in particularly at the moment, so those labeled as the amateur lower bands or lower amateur bands on the uh, desktop for the uh, SDR Uno. On the 2200 meter band, again, everything did look remarkably uh, constant between all four loops. However, one thing that was seen is that some extra signals appeared on both the LZ1AQ and also the Bonito Mega Loop that are not present for the Wellbrook and the cross country wireless antennas. Now, I don't know if these are real signals here or whether this is some sort of intermodulation distortion or interference effect. The Bonito and LZ1AQ loops don't generally appear to have greater sensitivity and they don't on uh, this band either for established signals, nor are they physically closer to any particular noise sources in that, as we just determined before, is the LZ1AQ and the cross-country wireless that were closest to the house. So the Bonito is actually furthest away from anything. This could be a, an issue with the, or an issue, an artifact of the fact that we partition the measurements between two RSP Duo devices, that the LZ1AQ and the Benito Megaloop share one RSP Duo, and the Cross Country Wireless and the Wellbrook share a second RSP Duo, and we see both of these uh, small artifacts here with one of the RSP Duo devices. So if that is somehow picking up more noise, from a USB port in a computer or whatever, then maybe that could explain part of what we're seeing here. I wouldn't say it's a big effect, and certainly all the signals that we can see are that are established signals and common to everything 
they all appear to be about the same uh, strength and also with about the same amount of signal to noise ratio. The second amateur band that was examined was the 630 meter band and as you can see here there really wasn't enough activity on the bands on this band to form any real uh, conclusions as to how well the different loop antennas worked. One thing that was noticed is that there did appear to be uh, various spikes on the spectral plot that were constant or consistent between the three Benito cross-country wireless and Welbert loops. The LZ1AQ saw those spikes but also saw some others which were tended to be present on at least one of the other loops. So whether or not the LZ1AQ has some slightly improved sensitivity or whether it's uh, as set more sensitive to mixing than all the three other three loops put together I don't know but I think generally in comparison to the some of the previous results the LZ1AQ does seem to be as sensitive if not more than the other loops so maybe it is actually receiving something that the other loops are struggling with. The 160 meter band was very noisy during the daytime when I went to perform the test between the four loops so I went back in the middle of the night to take a, a second measurement uh, that's why the uh, the picture is quite dark in this case and, and difficult to discern. I did manage to identify a 1950 kilohertz LSB amateur transmission uh, and managed to uh, lock onto it for all four uh, received loops. I think a fair conclusion there is the LZ1AQ and the Wellbrook loops were most sensitive to this amateur transmission with the Bonita loop being slightly less sensitive. Again, all four of them could receive the transmission, uh, just the, the quality was slightly better for the LZ1AQ and the Wellbrook. On the 80 metre amateur band, there were no real winners or losers. Possibly the LZ1AQ is slightly more sensitive, uh, shown on the, this group in the ellipse here, where certain signals are received slightly more strongly on the LZ1AQ than the other loops. I also looked at FT8 on the 80 meter band at 3573 kilohertz. Again, there were no obvious winners or losers uh, for those FT8 signals. Again, on this 60 meter band, all four loops showed very similar levels of performance. Again, on the 40 meter band, it's very much the same case again. Perhaps the Wellbrook was slightly less sensitive for FT8 operation when we looked at FT8 at 70, 74 kilohertz on the 40 meter band. An interesting artifact or two interesting artifacts that were seen are shown in the red ellipses uh, that although the LZ1AQ showed good performance on FT8, uh, it did seem to be more sensitive to this level of interference here than the other loops. Interestingly, the Wellbrook loop uh, for once seem to show a high level of interference at this point here shown in the red ellipse that the other loops didn't really show. Uh, that was somewhat surprising. The Wellbrook loop was placed furthest away from the house and furthest away from any conceivable interference sources but these are the results. On the 30 meter band there was a very similar level of performance between the four loops again maybe the well booked loop showing slightly degraded signal to noise ratio but nothing particularly significant. Again on the 20 meter amateur band everything looked very similar between the four antennas. Maybe the LZ1AQ and the well booked were slightly more sensitive than the other loops but if they were there wasn't much in it at all. And also some FT8 results were taken at 14074 kilohertz for the four loops and again there really wasn't much in it between uh, any of them. Uh, please disregard the uh, results at the bottom of the Wellbrook loop. This was just because I uh, uh, didn't let it settle long enough for take, before taking the screen snapshot. Uh, for the 15 meter band I was starting to get hopeful that I might see a few differences between uh, the different loops to make this uh, uh, video a little more exciting. Uh, that was really as just based on the thought that as we get above 20 megahertz maybe some aspects of the amplifier may come into play. And on the 15 meter band at 21.2 uh, megahertz the Benito loop seems slightly less sensitive than the others just judging from the height of the spikes on the spectral plot. The LZ1AQ did have some traces on the waterfall plot shown in red ellipses that none of the other loops had. 
maybe into modulation distortion. I didn't form a, a definitive conclusion on that, but certainly uh, those those uh, signals were not present on any of the other three loops. The Wellbrook loop seemed slightly more sensitive to noise on the FT8 waterfall plot, which we'll show here. This band towards the right hand side is slightly thicker than on the other loops, but in terms of the actual band itself, the FT8 band itself, uh, all of the signals between the four different loops appear to be similar. Uh, as the frequencies go up a bit more now towards 24.9 megahertz, hoping to see a few more interesting artifacts and differences between the different loops, well, it may appear that the Bonito loop is slightly less sensitive on the uh, 12 meter amateur band, and maybe the LZ1AQ is a little bit more sensitive. This is just based on the height of the uh, spikes that we see on the spectral plot. There was not much happening on the FT8 12 meter band at the time of these measurements, but I can show uh, the comparative results uh, for completeness. Interestingly, the LZ1AQ did seem to be picking up this interference source at the bottom end of the band more strongly than any of the other three loops. The 10 meter band, amateur band, was experiencing heavy interference at the time of these measurements. Although it showed the most interesting things, it was very difficult to form any conclusions from it. Certainly the LZ1AQ was picking up lots of interference, but interference was being picked up by the other loops, and I'm not sure I could really conclude anything more other than it's more sensitive. I happened to come across a amateur transmission on 28.050 kilohertz, which I managed to lock onto. This was a CW transmission, and it was received by all four loops. And it's fair to say that it's indicated by the blue arrow here on each case. I could actually hear the Morse code behind it. The Bonito provided the weakest reception by about 2 dBs, but all four loops could receive the signal, and none of them received it particularly strongly under these conditions. Uh, just for reasons of fun, I moved on to look at the 6 meter band at 52 megahertz, realizing that this was certainly above the upper frequency for the Wellbrook loop. As it turned out, uh, it was above the upper frequency for the Wellbrook loop, and it was pretty deaf in the 6 meter band. The LZ1AQ and the cross country wireless loops both showed the, the best performance and similar performance in the 6 meter band. Interestingly, the Benito loop showed very poor performance, and I was a bit surprised by that because depending on which mode the Benito loop is used in, it either has an upper limit of 52 megahertz or 180 megahertz, be mode dependent, and so I expected that this would not be a signal that it would show particular difficulty with, but as it turned out, it didn't seem to uh, receive very much at all, so that's uh, Maybe it's something to do with the way in which it's set up, but I don't believe so. After having tried out signals towards the upper limit of the uh, frequencies for which the loops would work, responding to feedback from their previous uh, posts on YouTube, I looked at some VLF signals as well. On the recommendation of Andy Howlett, and many thanks, he recommended some military signals, uh, GQD and GVT, which were on 19.5 kilohertz and 20 22 kilohertz and these are signals from Cumbria in the UK so probably about 150 200 miles from where I'm receiving so I, I looked at those as an example for how well the loops would work with that type of low frequency signal a few hundred miles away for 19 kilohertz and 22 kilohertz the Benito loop showed slightly better SNR than the LZ1AQ and the Wellbrook the cost crunchy wireless showed about 1 to 2 dB lower SNR than the LZ1AQ in the Wellbrook. So again, in this case, Benito at the low frequency showed the best performance and the cost crunchy wireless slightly worse. I also, whilst I was looking at the VLF bands, uh, looked at the 60 kHz MSF uh, time signal. Uh, again, broadcast from Cumbria, so this is about 150, 200 miles away and all four loops showed very similar performance with that signal. So that takes us to the end of the, uh, the measurement and test phase of uh, this exercise. 
So what I thought I'd do is have uh, one uh, slide just showing the summary and conclusions from this work. So I think it's fair to say that all four loop antennas worked well. None of the loops had a significant failing, or if it did, it didn't have a failing that, that was very obvious to me. Possibly the Wellbrook and the LZ1AQ were slightly better performers, but this is a marginal viewpoint and I totally accept that under different conditions it could go the other way because this was not a definitive uh, comment that could be put to all of the different bands. In terms of choosing a magnetic loop, a wide or a wide band uh, magnetic loop antenna, probably cost and ease of bring up are key deciding factors. The Wellbrook and Benito loops come fully assembled and ready to use, so plug them in and they work. The cross country wireless loop comes with an assembled mast amplifier and a wire loop, so you would have to construct a rigid loop if that's what you wanted. If it's not what you want, you don't need to construct it. And the Bias T didn't come in a case, so that would need constructing by the user. In addition, you would need to supply a power supply. None of these are difficult tasks, but it really depends on how practical the particular um, user would be at the end of the day. If you want something you can plug in and use and that's it, probably the Wellbrook and the Benito are better. The Cross Country Wireless does require some amount of work. The LZ1AQ does have many modes and you do need to construct a separate box with switches if you want to make full use of those. And I must be honest, in order to get this comparison working, I hardwired the mode that I would want and left it at that. As with the cross country wireless antenna, the bias T for the LZ1AQ does not come in a case and a power supply needs providing. So I think it's fair to say the LZ1AQ is the more difficult loop of the four to get working. Now, I work in the electronics industry. I do not, for me, that was not a difficult task at all. But if you are looking for something that is complete and ready to go, the LZ1AQ has, is at a disadvantage there. The fourth factor, probably this could be the main one for many people, is cost. The cross-country wireless LAA++ and the LZ1AQ are by far the lowest cost options by you know, several factors in, in this. And therefore, if you want something as an experimental loop or something, or you, know, you, you don't want to spend particularly great sums of money on this, then maybe the Wellbrook and the Benito are the loops to avoid. And in terms of industry presence, the Wellbrook loop does have a very good reputation with amateurs and, and has its own dedicated Facebook page. And from what I've seen on that and other Facebook pages devoted to magnetic loop antennas, the Wellbrook loop seems to have a very high level of performance, a very strong following and has uh, Wellbrook as a company has a good reputation for customer service. Uh, I've never dealt with them, but as a guy that Andy, who people uh, uh, speak very highly of for his response to any problems that, that uh, users have had with his products. One thing I think it's, <coughs> pardon me, fair to say, some customers using the Wellbrook loop have experienced problems with water ingress. I don't know how well those loops are set up. Looking at the Wellbrook loop, it didn't appear to be any uh, less robust than the others but anyway that, that maybe it's just a case of more people have been using them for longer and that, that's one of the artifacts that's come out over time. So this brings us to the end of the four-way magnetic loop comparison. Future work will involve uh, looking at the MLA 30 plus loop which I, I have at the moment but obviously couldn't uh, combine as a fifth loop in a four loop comparison with two um, RSP duo devices. So I will be looking at that in the future and it will be the subject of another video. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, excellent in-depth comparison. And uh, if you have any comments on uh, Mike's video and the assumptions used, feel free to add your comments and this can uh, help guide and influence uh, future videos that uh, Mike will be undertaking in the uh, in the weeks ahead. Today we saw four superb uh, magnetic loops in action, all highly recommended by SDR Play for use with the RSP family of SDR receivers.
So watch out for more videos in this series and once again a big thank you to Mike Harwood for uh, undertaking this uh, very interesting project.